Hey guys, and thanks for checking this out. This is the uh, third of our series of mini tutorials to uh, introduce you guys to MATLAB and some of the most important functions and features that we're going to use throughout the course. Um, last time we took a look at uh, matrix multiplication and division, as well as defining matrices in some simple shorthand uh, notations. And today what we're going to do is take a look at uh, for loops and uh, plotting commands to uh, make nice pretty graphs that make me smile when I have to grade them and give you 100%, which is of course what I want to do. So as with the previous tutorials, uh, you don't have to watch this entire thing, uh, nor do you have to watch any of it, but if you think that this might be helpful, then feel free to stick around. So last time I watched my own tutorial, and aside from sounding really weird to myself, I decided that it was a little bit mundane, a little bit boring, uh, we just kind of like took some random numbers and did some random garbage and you know that's never that's never fun so this time what I decided to do was throw together a bit of an example here so it's just an example uh, I'm gonna put this up on Avenue you guys can take a look I'm also gonna put up the code that we're going to use so you guys can check it out if something's not entirely clear and it's just a pendulum example so we've got a pendulum suspended from the ceiling it's at some angle uh, from vertical just like that it's got a length L uh, I don't have its mass on it, because uh, for these uh, equations we don't require it. And uh, what we want to do is we want to take this pendulum and assume that there is friction involved with the ceiling. Uh, and so it is subject to an exponential decay in terms of its amplitude as it's swinging back and forth. It'll slowly come to rest. And uh, it follows this equation where theta is a function of time is equal to the initial angle times all that garbage right there where theta naught is the initial angle, g is gravity, tau is the exponential decay constant, l is the length, and t is time. So our objective here is to uh, calculate and plot the angle of the pendulum with respect to time over a simulation time of 10 seconds for a variety of initial angles. So it should obviously, you know, if I start it farther out here, it should stay airborne longer, so to speak, and or just have a larger amplitude to begin with. So we know information about the pendulum, we know its length, we know the friction factor. We know we want to simulate this in 0 0.01 intervals of a second. Uh, there should be a dot 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 there, just ignore that. Uh, it goes all the way up to 10. And uh, we want to look at four different initial angles. So we'll do pi by 12, pi by 9, pi by 4, and pi by 2. So first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go over here. You can see I've got my T3 already saved up uh, into my workspace. And we're going to just enter the information that we know already. So let's enter known information and then as I like to do we will section this off like so and let's start with uh, just these bullet points right here so let's start with theta naught so theta naught I'm going to theta with a zero is equal to and then in our square brackets um, we're going to do pi by 12 now something cool about MATLAB is that it knows that pi as in pi is the number pi so I can do pi by 12 and then I can do pi uh, by 9. Now something else that you're able to do is if you do pi with uh, just open and close black brackets right after it, that just uh, considers it as pi the function with no inputs, which will return the number pi, but uh, MATLAB is smart enough that you don't need those brackets. I think you need them in Microsoft Excel. Uh, not that it makes much of a difference, but it works either way is the point. So pi by 4 and pi by 2. We'll go ahead and introduce that stuff right there. And then uh, we'll go over here, make a comment you know, initial, whoop, excuse me, initial angles. There you go. So now let's add the other information. So we got G here, and that's 9.81. We'll go over here. That's gravity. And then, you know, sometimes I like to add in my units. So that's meters per second per second, or meters per second squared. Uh, if you watch the first tutorial, you'll know that divide and then divide is the same thing as dividing by something squared. And then I'll go ahead and add that uh, semicolon in there to complete that. We got L, uh, that is 0 0.75. Uh, we'll call that uh, meters here. So that's length. And then we'll go over here, and that is meters. And then we have, uh, we have tau. So I'm going to just write out tau like that, and it's 0 0.3. And that is, uh, we'll call that friction, friction loss. And uh, by the way, if you press tab when you're still uh, attached to a comment, it'll try to complete the comment for you, But so you have to press spacebar. It's kind of silly. Um, and that's in 1 over seconds. Now, the reason for that is just because we're multiplying it by time here, so we need to have that unit list up there and that exponential, so that is kind of your frequency loss, so to speak. 
And now let's define our time vector. So our time vector, just like we did before with x in tutorial 2, we're going to start at 0, go in steps to 0 0.01, and we're going to go up to 10. And now I'm going to leave out those square brackets like I did last time, because if I put them in, it'll give me a warning. It doesn't affect anything, it'll still work, but I like to have that green square up there in the corner. So this is the time vector, and this is in seconds. So there we go. Now, <coughs> uh, one other thing that I'm going to do right now is I'm going to introduce n. So n is typically used, small n, as a placeholder for like the length of something or the number of time steps that you want to simulate. So in this case, I want it to be the number of time steps I'm going to simulate with t. So we got a couple of different commands for that. We could use size, um, and we could also do uh, the length command, you know, that sort of thing. Or, s excuse me, we're not going to use it to simulate the number of times. We're going to see how many different initial angles that we're going to do. So I could take the length of theta naught, or I could take the size of theta naught. So I'm going to just do the length because it's a vector. Theta naught, just like that. And that should, that should work fine. So now if I uh, I'll minimize this, if I go ahead and run this code, which we should be doing as we're going along, I'll just check on n. So n we know is 4. There's 4 entries in theta naught. If I check out t prime, it um, goes all the way down to 10 in intervals of 0 0.01. So that's all good. So our known information is, um, is known. So I'm just going to take a, a quick detour here, and I'm going to describe what exactly it is that we're trying to look for. So what we want to do is we want to simulate, based on time, the angle of the, uh, the pendulum, if I can bring that back up there, uh, for every different initial angle. So it might be difficult to visual visualize, but I feel like it might be a little easier if I pull up an Excel worksheet. So I'm going to bring this over here. And what basically we're trying to do here is if, if I were to make an Excel spreadsheet of this entire thing, where time goes all the way down like this, and the initial angles go across the top like this, I basically want to calculate the position, which is just this exact, sorry, this exact equation right here, um, at every point in time based on the initial angle as I go down. You see? So what I'm going to end up with is just a vector of, of the positions. This one only goes to 0.35 because I didn't want to go all the way. But I'm going to have a vector of all the positions, uh, angular. This is theta at t for t from 0 to 0 0.35 for this initial angle. And then what I can do is do the same thing for this initial angle, this one, and this one. So what I'm going to end up with is, say, uh, a 1,000 by 4 uh, matrix. And each of those is going, each column is going to represent the um, position of the pendulum with respect to time. And then the second dimension is where it started. So that's exactly what we're going to create. We're going to create this, you know, 1,000 by 4 uh, matrix in MATLAB using some loops. Which, uh, which is not as difficult as you might seem. So I have a quick comment here. I don't want to have to type the entire thing in. But one quick thing that I need to point out is that when you're dealing with loops, sometimes it's a little bit easier to initialize your matrix to be uh, a bunch of zeros. So I, sh I taught you guys the zero command last time. Uh, I told you it would come in pretty handy, so it's going to come in handy right now. What we're going to do is I'm basically going to take this box right here, and I'm just going to make that 1001 by 4 matrix, and I'm going to make them all zeros. Uh, and this is so that those numbers can be overwritten inside the loop instead of having to grow the matrix inside the loop, which can be a little bit uh, uh, time consuming. So I'm going to call up theta. So theta is going to be my results, not to be confused with theta naught, which is a different thing. And I'm going to, and I'm going to call it zeros. And now the number of rows that I want, uh, I'm getting a whole bunch of advice here. I don't want your advice. Uh, the number of rows I want in this case is going to be n, which is 4. So I guess I lied. This is going to be transposed right now. So I'm going to have 4 rows and 1,001 columns. And then the length of t, or the total number of time steps that I'm going to do, is going to be the number of columns. And that's going to do that right there. So if I run this, and I go back to my workspace here, and I type in theta. I'm going to get a whole pile of zeros. If I type in theta prime, it might be a little easier. This is how it would look in Microsoft Excel. I'm going to get a whole bunch of zeros from zero all the way up to simulation time, 10 seconds, just like it was right here, except the numbers are filled in on this one. So that's that.
that's just a useful thing to try to get yourself uh, faster calculations. It's not necessary, but it's recommended. Uh, you'll get a, a warning from MATLAB that if you have a loop that's growing, it, it might be a little slow. Usually it's imperceptible, but uh, if you want to have that nice green square, then you're going to have to go with initializing your vector of zeros. So, now, this is the part that gets a little bit crazy. So. For each of the initial angles, we want to calculate the angular profile over a 10 second simulation time. So it's for each of the initial angles, right? So why don't we do a for loop? So here's the syntax for a for loop. I'm going to create a fictitious index. I'm going to call it i. And I'm going to say for i equals 1 to n. So this means for each of the initial angles, um, there are four. n is 4. We know that. So there are four different initial angles. And then I'm going to go down a few lines here and type in end, so I close off that loop. And you'll see that MATLAB automatically tabs in everything inside the loop, so it's a little easier to read. Uh, there's only going to be one, one line in this one. Um, there are actually two ways to do this. We're going to look at both. But basically what I'm looking at is theta. So for this situation, I'm going to fill in every single, uh, in this case, column, but in, in reality, row, at the same time. And I'm going to do that using the dot multiplier. So here we go. It's going to be theta the ith row and all columns because I want to do every single uh, entry for each time period right and that's going to equal theta naught at i so for the first initial angle I want to use theta naught as pi by 12 so that's going to be that and then when it steps through and i is equal to 2 it's going to use the second initial angle and then I'm going to do times cosine let me uh, let's get the uh, Let's get the equation back up here. It's this guy right here, right? So that's going to be times cosine. And then square root is sqrt is a function of MATLAB. Whatever you want a square root goes inside the brackets after that. So it's going to be g over l, g over l, which we've defined both of those already up here. And then times t. Note that g over l t will not work. Um, you need to have that multiplication symbol inside there. And then I'm going to close off that bracket. So that's my entire cosine thing. So it's the square root of g over l. The t is not in the square root sign, so the t is outside of these brackets for the square root function. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to dot times that, because this right here is basically just a scalar. And then I'm going to, or sorry, no, that's a vector because of this t right here. But since this is a scalar, remember we don't need dot multiplication in there. So this is going to give me a vector that's about 1,001 long. So if I want to multiply it by another thing that involves t, which is what this exponent requires, then I'm going to have to use the dot times. And then e to the power of is just exp, just like it is in MATLAB, or excuse me, uh, Microsoft Excel, negative tau times t, because tau is a constant. I don't need a dot multiplier, and then a semicolon. And that's going to do it. So what that is going to do is calculate all of those guys. Let's take a look at this. We'll run that. And then we'll open this up. So if I look at theta prime, remember it was formerly all zeros, but now we've got a whole bunch of angles filled in. So it went through this loop four times. Each time it moved over a column, because I, I called it theta prime. In reality, it moved down a row, but in this case, it's a column. So it moved over one at a time. And each time it went through, it calculated this entire long column of numbers. And you can see that we go from positive numbers to negative numbers, which makes sense because the pendulum is swinging back and forth from its reference point of zero. So we know that we've got some sort of sine wave going on, and it seems to be getting smaller and smaller because it's decaying with tau. So that's kind of sweet. So there is another way to do this, and um, the other way to do it would be without using the dot multiplier, and that would be using uh, a nested loop. So we're going to um, comment this out. Remember, control R is for comment out, and we're going to try something else. We'll do 4i equals 1 to n, the exact same thing. We'll go down here and type in the n for that. But then inside that, we're going to do 4, and then I'm going to get another index. We'll call it k. Now, don't use the same one. Don't use i, because that'll screw you up every time. So k is 1 to the length of t. So basically, what I'm going to do right now is step into a column, and then the inner loop right here is going to step down the rows as we go along one at a time and it's going to fill in these numbers one at a time which is a little bit more time consuming but hey some people like it like that so I'm going to type in that end as well and now this is going to look almost exactly the same except instead of theta for all the rows it's going to be theta at i 
remember, same column, or same row rather, and K, because we're doing these one at a time. So instead of having the colon here for all of them, we're going to do them one at a time. And that bad boy is going to equal theta naught, the exact same as before, at I, times the cosine of square root G over L times T, now not just T this time, but T at K, because we're stepping through it one at a time, and then it's going to close that off. And then that's going to be times, now we don't need the dot times, because remember we're doing this one number at a time, exp of minus tau times t at k. So a little bit longer of, a, uh, of an equation, but it's going to achieve the exact same thing. So if I run this now, and I type in theta prime, I'm going to get the exact same results. And it's almost imperceptible how much uh, longer or shorter it might have taken. Um, and that's just because this is a very basic calculation, but once you get into more complicated stuff, things get a little bit more uh, messy. So that's that. So we'll just leave that for now. We'll leave that other one just hanging up there for a little while. And uh, now we get to do my favorite part of any MATLAB assignment. Uh, we get to do some nice, fun plotting stuff. So let's, let's talk about the plotting code. And uh, I'll go ahead and do this section ourselves off here. So one thing that I want to talk about, I'm going to clear this away for a second before I get into this, is if you're ever having problems uh, and you're not entirely sure what the syntax for a certain function is, like say the plot function, going over here to the command window typing in doc plot with a space, or doc anything you want, any of the functions that you're going to use, it's going to bring up a very helpful uh, help window here that's going to tell you what the inputs are, what some of the property values are, and it's going to give you some uh, what I think to be very very helpful examples so uh, it, it shows you like for whatever lines of code you put in what the output is going to be uh, which I find is the most useful way to learn this kind of stuff so if you're ever uh, looking for it say say you don't know how to do a semi-log y plot just type in doc semi-log y and you're uh, you're good to go but we don't need that because I'm a pro with the plot command so we're gonna do this so we want to plot um, four lines on the same graph. So we want to plot it for each of the initial angles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up this command called, oops, excuse me, my bad. It's called hold on. Now what that means is if I were to uh, continuously call the plot command, what would end up happening is that it would just make new windows or it would overwrite the existing window depending on how you're looking at it every time. But I want to have four lines at the same graph, so I'm going to hold the current figure um, axes on. The other thing I'm going to do is turn box on. Um, so that is as easy as box on. And that's just going to complete the box or the frame around the figure. So if I run this right now, we're going to get a figure come up. It came on the other screen here, so I'll bring it over. We've got a figure coming up. It's got a box fully around it. Um, and it's just going to be hanging out here as figure one. So I'll close that right now. And now what we're going to do is, uh, is plot. So plot is the function. Now the first number that goes in, or the first vector that goes in, is your uh, x vector. So that's just going to be t, because t is the time. And then we want theta. Now we want theta, let's do it for the first initial angle. First initial angle, so 1. And I want all the columns. So I want all those entries that we uh, calculated there. And then what I'm going to do is do this r, which makes a red line, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, my favorite color, by the way. And then I'm going to put in a new or another uh, option called line width in single quotes after commas as we're going along here. So everything goes after commas. And now whatever number I put in after a comma in line width, it's going to assign with the line width. So I'm going to make it a line width of 2. Uh, the default is to have a line width of 1, just for the record. So I'll go ahead and throw a quick comment. R makes a red line. So that's what happens right there. So let's see what happens if we run this. Look at that over here. I've got a red line and it's our nice fun decaying kind of thing. Very cool. That's our initial angle of pi by 12 right there. So now, I want to plot the rest of them, right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to copy and paste our existing code because that's the way that we like to do it. But now we want the second initial angle, which is 2. So look, we just saved ourselves a bunch of time. We didn't need to write that out again. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up a G for a green line, hang on a second guys, I'm being interrupted, and 
and that is going to make a green line. So I'm going to change the comment here. I'll just put these in so that you guys know what's going on. So the line width changes the thickness of the line. I'll just do these one at a time. So if we run this now, what we're going to find is that, look, now I've got a red line as well as a green line. So that was kind of fun. So I'm going to copy these twice more because we have four initial angles after all. Da, 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 da. And now we want the third initial angle and the fourth initial angle. So let's choose some different colors. Let's try a black line. And then this is a blue line. Black is K, blue is B. They both start with B, but you know, black is K. Accept it. Don't argue with me. So I'll put in these comments that I had originally over here, and then we'll do that. So now we run that. Look at this. We've got some really cool graph here. It's got our different lines, and it scaled itself appropriately. Our biggest initial angle was pi by 2, which is up there at about 1.7. So, or sorry, um, 1.55 or 1.6, you'll excuse me. And there you go. Those are all of our different stuff. But let's not stop there. Let's use some different... Uh, uh, features to make this look a little better. So what about like X label? That'll give us an axis on the X axis. So X label and then in a single string we can do time and then I'm going to put seconds in there just like that and then we'll close that off. Now we can do the same thing for Y label, Y label and then we can do uh, pendulum angle or something and that's in radians. Close that off just like that. And then let's let's give it a title. Why not title? I'm not a big fan of titles, but you know what are you going to do? Pendulum angle as a function of time. Why not? So there we go. So let's try that. Let's see what that looks like. So here we go. You see we got our title up there. We got our angle, and we got our time. So very cool. So the last thing that we're going to do here is uh, add a legend. And I'm going to show you one of the most fun things that I like about uh, about MATLAB. So let's let's add a legend. So here we go, legend. Now the legend is clutch because it'll uh, do exactly what you think it does. But on top of that, um, the way it is input is that whatever the order that you plotted lines on the same uh, plot are. Uh, remember we got hold on right now, so it's plotting them all on the same axes. Uh, that is the order at which the colors to assign a legend will arrive. So in single quotation marks, separated by commas we need to write the four uh, things that we want to write up here, which are just going to be our different initial angles. So let's do this. So I can say theta not equals uh, like pi divided by 12. So that's fine. Let's try running that. What happens? Well, it's going to have a legend come up here. And it's going to say theta not equals pi over 12, which is kind of cool. And the rest of them I left blank, as you can see down here, so there nothing's going to come up just yet. But let's do something a little more clever. So MATLAB knows what symbols are, mathematical symbols are. It is, after all, a mathematical programming language. So let's, instead of theta not, let's actually use the Greek letter theta. So I can do a backslash here and then do theta not. And if I do that, look what happens. I'll run that right there. And my theta turned into an actual theta pretty spectacular, if you know what I mean. Now on top of that, I can put in an underscore after theta, and then whatever the thing coming after the underscore is, is going to be subscripted, as long as it's inside these single quotes. So now theta naught is going to turn into um, an actual theta naught. Now on the same lines, we can go ahead and put the backslash in front of pi, and we'll actually get the Greek letter pi. So now what happens when I run this? Look at that, theta naught equals pi by 12. It looks a lot more professional, not bad. So we'll close that off there. And then what I'm gonna do is to make it easy on myself, I'm gonna just copy this and paste it inside all these single quotes because that is what I like to do. Except this time, instead of theta naught is pi by 12, it's pi by nine. This one is pi by four and this one is pi by two. And now when I run this, we're going to get a nice cool legend up there that's got our different initial angles associated with each of the colored lines, and it looks pretty sweet. So the very last thing here, I'm not a fan of the box around the legend, so there's an option for legend called box off, and I'm going to go ahead and do that, and then because I'm holding on right now, if I want to plot a different plot, I'm going to have to call hold off, and then if I ever make another graph, um, I'm going to go ahead and 
make a new window for it because I don't want to keep plotting things on the same axes because sometimes that's obviously not what you want. So now let's go ahead and run that. You can see that the box has come off the legend. It looks pretty cool. We got our axes, we got our labels, and uh, that's, that's not bad. So the last thing you can do, I think, we can try this. We can try grid on, and let's see if that works. And then if we go ahead and do that, then we can get the hatch lines inside there. Uh, some people like it. I'm kind of neither here nor there about it. It kind of messes with the legend a little bit, but you can do that if you like. And then, why don't we just put in a couple of uh, cool lines at the end. Now, using the fprintf command that we did before, I can just say, I'm just copying this from a different file. This program is terminated successfully. Remember, this makes a new line, backslash n. And then percent %g, placeholder, different initial angles were simulated over a time of placeholder. And then new line. And so we simulated 4 at a simulation time of the last element in t, which is 10 seconds. So if I run this whole thing, my final window that pops up over here gives us our cool little graph. It says that the program is terminated and that we simulated four different initial angles over a time of 10 seconds, and there you go. So that's all I've got for you guys today. I hope that that was kind of useful, and I hope that this kind of plotting code, which uh, you're more than welcome to use for yourself, uh, just to make the adjustments as you need to for different variables and different colors. There are lots of different options, uh, like I'll just give you a, a quick one. RS makes squares, G dot will make dots, uh, K line will make a line, and BV will make uh, triangles, blue triangles. So if I run this, uh, you can see that I'm going to get some some much different looking things. I'll, I'll make this a little bigger so you can see that these are the triangles. Those are actually squares right there. You can you can zoom in on this if you want to take a look at them. We'll do that. See, there's the squares and then the green dots. So that, uh, that kind of thing is possible as well. And then the legend updates itself accordingly, which is kind of nice. So I will put this up on Avenue and uh, you guys are more than welcome to check it out. Now bear in mind that it would work the exact same way if we kept our original for loop uh, compared to our little longer one here. But uh, in any case, I hope you learned something, and I hope you join me for the next tutorial where we talk about uh, defining and troubleshooting functions. So thanks for your time, and I'll see you guys later.